Some of the most painful accusations and deadliest suspicions exchanged between Christians and Jews have involved the well-being of children. In all communities, of course, children represent at times uh, purity, innocence and utmost vulnerability. They define zones of uh, sensitivity and are thus rich with symbolic potential, with symbolic meaning. They produce prompts for emotions, for solidarity and for hope. There was a time when scholars uh, considered, were actually stopped and thought whether indeed medieval people had uh, a deep and complex understanding of childhood at all. Some of you may remember uh, the public, some of you may know of the very, very influential publication by the French historical demographer, and it's important to know that he was an historical demographer, Philippe Ariès, who in 1960 wrote a book in French called The Enfant et la Vie Familiale sous l'Ancien Régime, and then it was soon, very soon, translated in 1962 as Centuries of Childhood, a Social History of Family Life. So historians following the publication of his book engage in a great debate because Ariès argued that and this came out of the fact that he, as a demographer, was confronting the devastating facts of uh, infant and child mortalities over the uh, longue durée, he, uh, the period of l'ancien régime, so for us that's medieval and early modern, let us say. And he assumed, therefore, that parents living under such woeful demographic regimes would have had attitudes to their children very, very different from modern people. He uh, employed what was at the time a very, very uh, common understanding or approach uh, to the social sciences and the humanities, one we might call functionalist, which really sought to find the cultural patterns and patterns of sociability fitting in some very appropriate way uh, in almost a utilitarian fashion uh, expected um, demographic and economic realities. So with such tragically low expectations that offspring would indeed grow into, into adulthood, that you know, they would survive, he argued, parents invested little emotion in their really young children, and those who survived were then trained to become sort of hardy, productive, working adults. For historians of later periods, that is for modern historians, this made quite a lot of sense. After all, very often modernists treat the Middle Ages as a time and a place that is merely a prolegomenon quite before periods of sort of rational sophistication and emotional refinement. You'll remember that in the 60s and 70s, the very great English historian, Lawrence Stone, particularly in the period when he was operating uh, uh, from Princeton, uh, argued that the effective family, the family bonded and close through rich emotional ties and a whole lot of sociability together in the household was really something that came to be in the 18th century. Modernization, progress, belief in progress, all of these prepared scholars and readers to accept the notion that medieval people had little time for or sense of the uniqueness of childhood, of the range of emotions which interactions between generations can inspire. So, having had this massive sort of intervention by uh, Philippe Ariès, medieval and early modern historians fought back. They just knew it wasn't right. And they answered Ariès's challenge in polemical fashion. The leader of the team of rebutters was uh, the Israeli uh, medieval historian Shulamit Shachar, who was a, uh, a bereaved mother and twice bereaved aunt, who simply, and I remember her talking to me about it, she simply says it just didn't make any sense. It's not how she knows, you know, what she knows about the world and about history and so on. And she literally just started exploring and finding ways by reading a whole lot of medieval theology and, uh, and law and literature and liturgy and whatnot and trying to find ways and particularly devising methodologies which will allow you to get into these sources that are so often normative and so often about how the world should work 
nonetheless to get through some very interesting and sensitive readings, often leavened by theories of psychology and child development, to um, try and uh, recover something like um, a, a medieval experience of childhood and understanding of childhood. And uh, she used materials, for example, such as this. I'm sure those of you who've been on holiday in Siena will know this absolutely fantastic altarpiece of Saint Agostino Novello. And as you see, this, um, this saint, Agostino Novello, who's in the center. So there are four scenes, as you see, to either side, showing his great miracles. But the one I like best, I always return to every time I'm there, is this because you see a child is a child is fallen out of the window as children do and Agostino Novello as a sort of medieval sort of superman sort of swoops through and just saves the child in time before it hits the ground and you see it there with the clearly relieved relatives as the child is saved so by combining these sort of a whole range of materials uh, she attempted uh, to recover the sense of caring for attachment to even very young children and also the devising of special forms of education of games of pastimes for them even in the medieval past and Shulamit Shachar whose book was but a sort of synthesis of quite a lot of uh, let's say printed sources and materials available not to have, it wasn't quite an archival work opened the door then for far more archivally based researches and amongst the medievalists some of you may know the work of Barbara Hanawalt and Ruth Karras and Nicholas Orme and Didier Lett and they all followed with explorations of boys and girls of different in different parts of Europe and of course in different social uh, situations and so over recent decades, we have learned also from archeologists and art historians, from scholars of literature and medicine, and of course, from those who combine all those excellent approaches about the ideas and practices which bound parents, children, and communities. We know a great deal, a great deal indeed. Children tended to spend their earliest years around their mothers and female relatives in the hub of peasant or artisan, or merchant or indeed aristocratic households while they were always close to the facts and the reality of work in the domestic sphere they were as e they were as early as possible sort of they began to sort of receive sort of training into the position that they would inhabit in life they were also treated with care and tenderness whatever the peculiar situation. So for example, I just absolutely love this here image uh, from the uh, Danish church of Kirkerup, which is not from, far from Roskilde, from um, circa 1330. Now, I have to move. When I move, I have to move with this, so I mustn't forget it. Okay, so let me just explain what we have here. As you see, this is a wall painting, which shows the expulsion of Adam and Eve there with their fig leaf out of Eden. And of course, what that brings about is the, pain, the pangs of birth and toil. So it's only fitting then that you have this here image of a mother with two children tied to her, swaddled as she spins. And this here is a sort of drawing of it that you might be able to see in a better angle. So if you look at that for the color and at that for the arrangement, you will see what I mean. So those of you, I hope you can see that what you have is a woman at work doing the sort of you know, typical female work, which is in preparation of textiles, while balancing two swaddled children on her hips, okay? And a much more gracious and grand and indeed luxurious book, the Book of Hours made for the Duchess of Helder's Catherine of Cleves in the 1460s uh, shows another area of how sort of uh, the ordered, the pious and ordered household is imagined in some of the material culture around uh, childhood. So for example here, as you can see, that is of course the household of uh, Mary and Joseph. And Joseph is having a bit of a snooze there and Mary, you know, in this very comfortable little bourgeois setup. Uh, you know, is there, of course, tending to her child. But my favorite is actually another page in this book, which is, as you see, Mary is now at work. She, too, at weaving there. And, and, and Joseph is at his carpentry. But the little boy you can see there is in his walker. He is safe. <laughs> he won't fall into the fire as so many, because most children suffered accidents, either falling into fires in the Middle Ages or falling into sources of water. 
uh, uh, drowning in water, and he is there safe, learning to walk. And I always like to think that it's just slightly significant that he's a tiny bit closer marginally to his father than to his mother, and he will soon learn the secrets of carpentry. Childhood then was understood as a formative stage during which the person was marked as if by a stylus on wax. That's a very old image. The marking of age occurred alongside the marking of gender. Even in the harsh conditions of life in Greenland, of all places, uh, items of clothing that have been recovered from circa 1200 show us that men and women, that men wore garments dyed in dark colors, brown, black, that women's dresses were decorated with patches of contrasting colors, sort of dappled, and that children were dressed on the whole in white and gray, sort of colors of purity or non-color. Alongside medical tracts for women's health, there were often sections on children and their care. We may expect that then, as now, most knowledge of childcare was actually conveyed informally, within families, between friends, until, that is, the child was old enough to enter the public sphere. But Jewish children occasionally we have glimpses of them actually going out of the female sphere, maybe giving mum a break, when fathers take them to synagogue with them even before they are they are pro pro properly fit to be taken out in public. And we know that because we have occasional rabbinical, rabbinical opinions, advice about how a man might clean or rather cleanse himself after being peed upon by his child in synagogue. But that is, <laughs> I can't pretend I found that example. It's from Elisheva Baumgarten's fantastic book about family life, uh, Jewish family life in the Middle Ages. But that is an exception for, on the whole, uh, for men, childcare was considered a distraction from other more important activities. And of course, in the case of the Jews, that might be the study of the law. But Jewish boys soon entered the sphere of the study of law. And this happened around the age of five or six, when they just began to learn their alphabet and to read. On the festival of Shavuot, the fe festival of Pentecost, the festival which marks the giving of the Torah to, uh, to the Israelites, the child was wrapped in a prayer shawl, a talit, and led to his teacher. At his teacher's lap, a rite of initiation quite extraordinary took place, which we know a great deal about thanks to the work of the wonderful Ivan Marcus and his book, and I particularly like that picture because you see there from a 13th century German manuscript the representation of what I'm about to describe to you. One of the best descriptions of the ritual of initiation of the Jewish boy into study is provided by Rabbi Eliezer, son of Judah of Worms, who lived between 1160 and 1230, in his book Sefer HaRokeach, the book of the perfumer. Uh, and the citation often gestures, as you will notice, even if you don't know an enormous about, amount about this tradition, reminds us of and uses verses which have to do with the uh, giving of the Torah. So I shall cite here. A scriptural indication that the boy should be covered so that he will not see a Gentile nor a dog on the day he is instructed in the holy letter. This is a really special day. So you cover the child in a garment or indeed in a talit so that he doesn't see anything that might be displeasing or harmful, i.e. a Gentile or a dog, on his way to his teacher. And here we have sort of the base. It is based upon this, this, this verse, this, this, this uh, citation. No one shall come up with you and no one else shall be seen anywhere on the mountain. Neither shall the flocks and the herds graze at the foot of the mountain. So that's the first stage, bringing the child to his new teacher's home. The child is placed on the lap, bosom, chek. It's like sinus. It's very hard to know how to, uh, uh, to translate. So the child is placed in the, in the lap of the teacher, who sits him down to study, according to the verse. And Moses said to the Lord, did I conceive all this people? Did I bear them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries an infant? And according to the verse, I have pampered Abraham, Ephraim, sorry, taking them in my arms. So you see this is very, very common, just like Christian texts at the time, sort of, sort of telling you what to do and also bringing texts that seem to support or at least to be addressing the same sort of issues. And there is more. There is a ritual of um, 
of a recitation and a ritual of eating. So now that the child is there, having been brought and saved from seeing unsavory things, seated in the lap of the teacher, the teacher recites aloud from a tablet each letter of the alphabet forwards, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and the child recites them after him. Then they recite them backwards, Taf, Shin, Resh, Kof, and the child does so too. And the teacher puts a little bit of honey on the tablet, and with his tongue the child licks the honey which is on the letters. After that, they bring a cake kneaded with honey on which is written, inscribed, uh, the Lord gave me a skilled tongue to know how to speak timely words to the weary. The Lord God opened my ears and I did not disobey. I did not run away. Very familiar from Isaiah and it's quite important that it's an Isaiah quotation, I think. And we know from other texts, other prescriptive texts that, um, that describe the ceremony that um, sometimes it is thought that this bread with honey has to be, this cake of honey has to be kneaded and prepared particularly by a virgin person. This ritual is also described in the anonymous 13th century uh, German Sefer HaAsufot, which has additional verses. So, so there are verses inscribed on the cake and also on an egg, but different verses from the ones in the uh, the one I've just cited, the source that I just cited. So, so there's clearly some sort of structure to this ritual, although different communities might choose different variations or different texts favorite and more, more appropriate perhaps in the minds of those guiding them than others, but the structure is the same. And indeed, Ivan Marcus's book very openly, and it's a book that was conceived in the 80s and uh, written in the 90s, very much under the influence of sort of history and anthropology. How do you take this ritual at the heart of Jewish life and look at it indeed as a ritual with all the tools of understanding it as a rite of passage, as a rite of initiation, as well as comparatively with other religions and so on, while not losing the sense of this is Jewish ritual from a particular place at a particular time. He does an extremely good job, I think. And um, very interestingly, also Sefer HaSufot, the second, uh, the second Ashkenazi version of description of it, also describes another ritual that's done at the end of the festival of Shavuot, which uh, after the end of the day, so it will be at the evening, right? You take the child to a source of water, to a river or, or uh, well, a flowing water in any case. And there you abjure with the child that prince of forgetfulness, Potach, which would really get in the way of any appropriate study. So you go there and you say, you know, shoo, shoo, you prince of forgetfulness. And the ritual described is the following, it's at the bottom of the page. Ten times he should say these words, Nagaf, Sagaf, Agaf, I adjure you, Potach, the prince of forgetfulness, that you extract and remove from, my, from me a fool's heart and do so and so, and I am so and so and my father is so and so. It's, it's almost like a formula. This is the formula that has to be produced, a magical formula, clearly, and throw it on a high mountain. So if in my heart there's any space for this, uh, this devilish creature of forgetfulness, it will be cast far away. Sweet foods, incantations, the warm bosom of the teacher, the wrapping by a white shawl, all combine to mark the child with a sense of wonder and probably foreboding. This was all to make the child remember, for childhood is best savored through smell and sound and taste. Evocations of memory that Proust, of course, expressed better than anyone else. So it strikes me as significant and just occurred to me very recently that when cathars were examined in the 13th century when inquisitors got really interested in them uh, about, or rather the earlier sources of inquisitorial interest in them, which is from the 1240s, they often asked them, how did you first hear about this heresy, okay? And they often said, and I'm know this because my wonderful colleague at Queen Mary, Chris Parks, has literally a fortnight ago published his first book, which is about life cycle with a lot about childhood among the Cathars. And it's really interesting from the testimonies that people, when they're examined, they go back and they say, oh, I remember the day when I was just a child playing with my friends and a man or a woman, a, they're called the good man or good woman, bonhomme, bonne femme, uh, turned up and started like 
well, not preaching exactly, but sort of, you know, informing us about the Cathar beliefs. And they often left us with something sweet or nice to eat, like nuts or raisins, which are just the sort of uh, tokens of memory, but exactly the fruits and gifts that were given to the child in a Jewish ceremony after the completion of its more formal parts. Pedagogy may start with gentle sounds and sweet tastes, and there's, there's a room full of many teachers, so I'm sure you know this well, although we're far less strict than people used to be. But it was everywhere pedagogy was associated with punishment, discipline, and pain. Research on the training of children to sing, for example, by colleagues in, music, in the history of music shows just how truly painful and pain-laden and pain-celebrating, say, the training of a child to <coughs> sing in a uh, cathedral choir or in a, in a royal chapel indeed was. Uh, that um, we have the statutes from the 13th and 14th century for the boys' choir that sang in the Saint-Chapelle in Louis IX, uh, uh, the, the chapel that he created, the Saint-Chapelle in Paris. And these young singers, it's a really punishing routine of practice and repetition, of standing for hours, of, uh, of, of, of being prodded if you're dozing off and falling asleep. And even when they're once a week, they're taken out uh, uh, to sort of walk around the town to take the air, they're not allowed to whistle or sing any of the king's music. Yet before this age of learning and training and pain, children were associated with the realm of women, like those two babies tied to their mother. For Christians, this sphere was frequently visualized in the late medieval um, elaborations of the holy kinship, the holy family and the holy kinship. Jesus' immediate family and his extended one that gets increasingly extended as the medieval uh, decades uh, evolve. The emphasis on the cult of Mary, of course, which you've heard a lot about already in these lectures, led to a renewed interest in the details of her own family life indeed her own childhood. These are, of course, subjects that are not treated in the Gospels, but they drew the interest of, well, it's even before the word Christian exists, so the followers of Christ, let us say, even in the second century when we have what later comes to be called the Proto-Gospel of James, but it's a collection of, of narratives about really Mary's backstory, you know, who were her parents, where did she come from, how did she grow, how did she become so pure, wise, and pious. <coughs> And some, it's interesting that some of the most beloved and, and important narratives about Mary's life actually do not come from the Gospel. They come from these very, very early apocryphal traditions and ultimately reach uh, the Latin repertoire as well. So think of, first of all, the, 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 the pre-childhood, you know, how she was conceived and born. It's those, the sad story of her parents who had totally given up, despaired in their old age of ever having a child. And of course, there's nothing so tender like that rendering there of that fateful kiss. And then of course, after her conception is her birth, and then she lives at home a very pure life. She's described in the proto-gospel as never having, her foot never touched the ground. It was always, they always saw to it that it was never on actual ground. It was on, presumably walking on some lovely cloths and, and uh, all her food, she didn't suckle, she, she, her food was brought by angel and so on. So there's a tremendous sort of filling in of gaps and interest in the, uh, the detail of uh, Mary's life that's picked up again in the 12th and 13th century after th that, that very aus auspicious beginning in the very early centuries uh, of Christianity. And it's not just Mary's life, it's Jesus's life too. It's his family. Oh, and there's a betrothal, of course, of Mary and Joseph, again, which is described in great detail in the Proto-Gospel. But, you know, he, uh, Jesus acquires a granny uh, an, uh, an old woman saint. There aren't many like old, I should say older woman, not old woman, older woman saint uh, that becomes very popular in the late or middle ages. And she becomes important because Anne is such a support to her own daughter. She's herself often shown teaching her daughter uh, uh, to read. And sometimes it's in a sort of trinity of Anne and Mary and Jesus as well, like you see there. And a further extended family because Anne, well, there you have, um, uh, the, these women with Jesus, all the women in his life. But even as interestingly, or more interestingly perhaps, is by the 15th century, and this is 
an example, I didn't even put the name there because it's an example of what are hundreds of surviving painted carved groups, very, very common in German churches, German parish churches, of this extended family of Mary, of Anne, who was supposed to have been married three times. So she's got, you know, all these sort of multi-generational families with all the sort of step relations and so on, all making that sort of group. And of course, Jesus amongst his cousins in that sense as well. So uh, just in terms of visualizing and reflecting on and preaching about and telling stories about and just seeing on a regular basis, child, children in childhood are becoming more frequent and more available to people. And probably a family like that looks very much like the sort of families in cities in Germany that people had with all the different connections. It's not multi-generational and multi-complex families are not just uh, the as sometimes we are told, the, the, the outcome of our own dysfunctional ways. The point of entry into education then, apprenticeship, clerical training, learning to read, marked a separation of sorts between boys and girls. And it continued to be reinforced in dress and comportment in attempts to mark out the spheres of gender. But, and, and as we think of young people being trained into the world of work and community, we must of course note here the similarity between the Jewish and the Christian experiences. There used to be a time when people spoke very committedly and for reasons that one could elaborate about the separate spheres, you know, women in the domestic and husbands out there out in the world. In fact, when it comes to work and it comes to manufacture, things were far more complicated or, or, or perhaps just far more interesting. And that is the fact that, for example, even in guild related workshops, you know, a widow would run the workshop at the death of her husband in order to just continue the sort of flow of productive work, which is so necessary, you know, in the marketplace. And until a son, until a properly trained son could take over. Um, similarly, Hannah Mayer's wonderful uh, doctoral work, which alas, she, she's become a very fine civil servant, and I don't know if it'll ever be published, but it's possible to read in the Cambridge University Library's fantastic study of the work of Jewish women in the 12th and mostly 13th century England. They're doing everything. They are money lending in larger numbers than men are. Where are the men? Well, maybe some of them are studying, but of course a lot of them are probably on the road doing different types of different aspects of work that are more dangerous or arduous and away from home uh, because women are more needed at home. Jews and Christians witnessed the sometimes audacious experimentation with the potential of a God child. Just seeing the idea that, you know, the representation in color and shape and form of a child, of a God even in, in, in his infancy was obviously quite challenging and Jews sometimes comment about the indignity of it as we've seen. But Vernacular versions of Jesus' life based on those early Christian uh, compositions became particularly many in the vernaculars after about 1250 or 1300. There are quite a few really interesting English and French versions. And what's interesting, and, and of course parishioners would also have access not just to sort of the tales told through, through, uh, through preaching, sort of brought into preaching as exemplar, or indeed those who are better off who could afford books and actually read them in books. But um, what's really interesting is that how much this, these vernacular narratives, and we've already noted in these lectures that vernacular narratives tend to push the boundaries of the sayable far further than the Latin elaborations of certain central uh, theological ideas. So these vernacular narratives really explore very hard, sort of they push the question, if Christ was really human as well as divine, then in his, human, huma, in his humanity as a little boy, was he really like all other boys? Was he naughty? Did jo Jesus get smacked by his dad when he was naughty? And all these questions, I mean, are both creative and playful, but actually very much to the point. So just to set the scene then, what we find is in these types of narratives is the issue of Jesus. Where are we going to send him to school? As a question that all parents know we have to ask ourselves. Where do we send him to school? Is he going to go to that Jewish school uh, and be taught by a Jewish teacher? Uh, we have this 
fantastic remain, which is one of a series of, uh, of glazed uh, tiles from England, early 14th century, that describe in image what we know from the surviving narratives, that uh, it was a real issue as to the education of Jesus, or so it was formatively put by the writers of the religious text. Legends about his life suggested that, the, and, there, and note the polemical tone, which is so interesting for us here, that uh, when Jesus went to school, well, the school looked something like that rather chaotic Jewish classroom with a teacher who is both cruel and useless. So he's cruel, but he also can't keep, um, can't keep order in the class. So you can't really learn very much in a situation like that. So the narratives tell us that uh, he fell out, in fact, twice with his teachers, one of them called Levi, and, you know, dad had to come in, talk to the teacher, this sort of thing. And in the end, there's some sort of situation where basically they opt for, uh, the parents opt for um, homeschooling. But homeschooling, so he gets into all sorts of other trouble, does Jesus. So for example, he was quite a cruel little boy, or rather, he had ups and downs, as, ch as children do. And as indeed medical texts tell us of the period that children are volatile like that because of the instability of their humors. So Jewish parents here, for example, there's a boy whom he uh, curses because the boy messed up some pools of water he was playing in. So um, the Jewish parents come to complain to Joseph about the son, his son, about his, and the word they use again and again is wanton and wild. Your son is wanton and wild. With his cursing, he has slain our child. Uh, so there is a situation that is sort of polemical, as it were. The Christian, the, 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 you know, obviously Jesus, uh, Jesus' family uh, um, are getting into trouble because of him, and he's precocious and he's special, and of course the Jews don't understand that. So there's an infinite sort of set of questions uh, that actually arise from a desire to explore. Well, these are, these, are, these are stories that evoke everyone's experience in just being around children, but also the specialness of the child, and how far can you go? How committed are you to this idea that Jesus was a real child? because he had to be really human. How far can you go? Because it sounds either blasphemous or disrespectful and so on. And as you see, they went quite far. Away from their mother's knee, children could get into trouble of many kinds, as you see. Around them were woven hope and anxieties, and they were very specific. They are very specific to time and place. Children suffered accidents, as I said. They were neglected, they were beaten and sexually abused. They were also cherished, and like so many children in this country um, over the centuries, were um, sent away from home for their own good, to grow up in institutions, be they monasteries, be they in courts, be they, of course, on, on training for the battlefield. And so children were offered up to the religious life, first very young, so in the early Middle Ages, up till about um, 1150, it was common to offer them really, really, really young, exactly when they are like wax, so they can get imprinted by the style uh, of religious life and, of course, for the benefit of their souls. But in the 12th century, there's a sort of change in thinking about what is it really to join the religious life? What is the importance of, of intention and commitment and self-understanding when you do this act of, which is called, of course, conversion, conversion to the religious life? And so that changes. So even across our period, there's a real change in understanding about sort of the autonomy of the child, the autonomy of the child to choose so children were sent away, if they're aristocrats, as I said, to courts, if they're uh, sometimes in order to develop bureaucratic careers, always in patterns that are very much like apprenticeship, like going and learning on the job, as it were. And even in rural communities or artisan workshops, children grew up closest to their parents, probably in those situations, learning to replace them as members of a guild or tenants of a serf's holding. One of the most disturbing tales told of Jews dramatizes many of these themes of work, nurture, and community. And of course, we've, we've encountered snippets of it uh, over the last few lectures because it's something I've been working around recently and find extremely interesting. This is the story of William of Norwich, a tale of a child's death of sanctity and indignation. The boy William was born to an Anglo-Saxon family in the village of Haveringland, which is about eight miles 
uh, northwest of, um, of Norwich. His mother was Elviva and his father, Winston. His maternal grandfather was famed for being a great interpreter of dreams. Our text is cast in a strong hagiographical hey, mode in its first third, which tells the story, constructs as it were, the story of a child's birth and ultimately his death, and in uh, the, basically the childhood section. But it is also revealing about social practices because the other two thirds are uh, dedicated to you know, one miracle after another as they occur at his tomb. So it's an enormously rich uh, um, text about childhood, although it's a rather special childhood, one which ends, as it were, it is claimed by the author as in a martyrdom. Nonetheless, it reveals some interesting social practices around children. The description of the ceremony of weaning, the ceremony by which the child was weaned, is an extremely, extremely rare and early one. And it's described like this. For on the day of his weaning, when his father, Winston, joyously offered food to the relatives invited to the feast, a certain penitent, his arms in iron chains, entered as if to beg for alms from those at table. After having eaten and delighted in his food, he took the little boy into his arms as if to admire him. And the boy in his childish innocence, fascinated by the iron chains, touched them with his little palms and the chains suddenly cracked and broke into parts. Those dining were stunned at seeing this and amazed at these wonderful ways. They ascribed what had happened to the boy's merits. And so the penitent, having been freed by divine grace, went away overflowing with thanks and the said priest, who was among the assembled guests, collected the broken chains and deposited them on display in the Church of Haveringland to serve as remembrance for those living and as knowledge for those to come, and took care to preserve them for a considerable time. So the parents were clearly attentive parents living out in the countryside in a nexus of family and parish, and they gave their sons names that were names full of promise, not Anglo-Saxon names, good and promising French names, Richard and William. The boy was educated at home, but when he reached the age of eight, he was sent to the city Norwich to learn the trade of tanning and become a skinner. Tanning and skinning was a massive industry in, um, in Norwich. In the city, he lodged with the master, a master skinner, who was to teach him the trade, and he soon displayed really precocious signs of spirituality. He was also really good at the job. Like the boy Jesus, he was far better than his elders. Note the reference to the age 12. Finally, he left the countryside, moved to the city, and lived with a certain master who was very well known for his skill. Rarely spending time in the countryside and now used to the city, he made great efforts with industry in his chosen craft and reached the age of 12. Then, while he was living in Norwich, the Jews who dwelt there at the time chose him above all other skinners for the repair of mantles, furs, and other things of this kind, which they either had as surety or which they themselves used. For indeed, they considered him highly valuable, either because they saw him as simple and skillful, or because, led by miserliness, they reckoned they could pay him a lower wage, child labor. Away from home then, William is hard at work with nimble and industrious fingers, surpassing his peers for diligence and talent. He also fasts a lot, far more than is allowed for a boy or indeed recommended for a boy of his age, we are told. Our author builds up the picture of a boy at risk though. He's in the city, he's away from family, and he has dealings with Jews. We are also told that his uncle in the city warned him never to have anything to the Jews, to do with the Jews again. There's always a challenge facing those who write narratives of abuse. How do you get the vulnerable person into the zone of danger, away from family and community into the predator's sphere of danger? Yet although Thomas lays down that trail which suggested the boy William worked for, for sort of that zone of imagination of a Christian child in Jewish homes. That is not the route that he ultimately uses when he brings on the eve of the 
the alleged killing when he brings the child together with the Jews. The Jews don't simply grab the boy one day when he comes to work for them, and in any case, he was told not to do so anymore. They rather tempt the boy with what boys like best, adventure, an occasion to work and to gain approval for their efforts. Adventure, and it makes me think as, you know, the, 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 the type of narrative that, that Thomas develops here and that you'll see in a minute of those hapless girls in the BBC studios very keen to become stars and thus becoming prey to knowing older exploitative men that we've heard so much about recently. So the emissary of the Jews in the Easter, in, in the lead up to Passover and, of, and, and Holy Week of uh, 1144, tempt the boy away exactly with that, away from his home at Easter in order to spend the holidays supposedly working in the kitchen of the Archdeacon of Norwich. So the agency of the Jews in the, in the matter of the killing of the boy William emerges six days before Easter, when an emissary seduces first the boy and then his mother. Monday after Palm Sunday dawned, that detestable messenger of the Jews set out to execute the task they had enjoined upon him and he finally found the boy William after searching for him with greatest care. Once found, he caught the boy with lying snares of words. Once caught, he deceived him with false promises. He pretended indeed to be the cook of William Archdeacon of Norwich and that he wished to have him as a co-worker in the kitchen. If he, the boy William, came with him, he would thus later enjoy many profitable opportunities. The naive boy was deceived and believed the man, but wanting to have the approval of his mother's goodwill in this matter, back in the country, because his father was already, had already passed away, he went to her with the messenger. So it's quite interesting, this sort of um, uh, uh, vulnerable boy is set up by Thomas. It's, it's, now it's the widowed mother. He's expected to spend time on the holidays with her. And in any case, he's a child, so he's easy to seduce they go to the mother. And this is really interesting. Notice here how the mother is set up uh, in, in quite ambivalent ways, you'll see. When they arrived there, the boy explained the reason for his journey and the traitor spread the snare of his lies as he had formerly expounded them. Promising much to be sure, that son of perdition easily enticed the childish mind with his empty promises. But at first he could in no way extract the mother's approval in the matter. The innocent boy agreed to the insistent traitor, but the mother resisted, her gut feeling warning her, fearing for her son with the maternal instinct. Now the traitor, and then the mother. Now, look at the, at the sort of rhetorical construction of this is absolutely, well, typical 12th century Latin. Now the traitor, then the mother. He begs, she refuses. He begs in order to destroy the boy. She refuses, lest she may lose him. He claims to be the Archdeacon's cook, but she does not trust him at all. Between her and him, and here's the element of sort of slapstick that is introduced, between her and him, as between a sheep and a wolf, who first would you think the strongest in the fight over the third? The lamb was in the middle, the sheep on the one side, the wolf on the other. The wolf stands in order to tear and devour. The sheep stands forth to rescue and save. But because the boy was lured, he favored one of them and repeatedly begged the agreement of the other, that is, of his mother. Until the mother, persuaded by both her son's many requests and also seduced by the man's good promises, was finally driven to agree, albeit against her will. She then begged for respite for her son until after Easter, but the traitor swore that he would not be without him for three days, not even for 30 pieces of silver. The mother refused and swears that she would not surrender her son before Easter. And so the traitor took out three shillings from his purse in order to undermine maternal sentiment and diverted towards avarice. This is my translation, but it's very accurate, although it's clunky and he diverted towards avarice, the unre unreliable firmness of feminine fickleness. So feminine fickleness is so firm, but he undermines it because it is fickleness uh, and corrupted by the glitter of silver. 
silver was offered as a gift, but rather it was the price of innocent blood. It all gets extremely sinister. And yet it's not over. And yet the mother's devotion was still not weakened, nor was her sense of foreboding of future evil easily allayed. It still continued, here with imploring and there with silver, so that if he did not soften the constancy of her resistance spirit by requests, the sheen of the brightness of money smiling at her might lure her to desire it. In these ways, the mother's spirit was severely shaken and her maternal devotion was already gradually wavering. She was finally lured by her desire for the shining silver coins, and thus convinced, she bowed to the very thing she did not want willy-nilly. And what more? When she was finally persuaded, the lamb was handed over to the wolf, and the boy William was handed over to the traitor. I hope you'll bear with me for having read out such a long section, but I mean, so very attached to it, but I also think there's a tremendous amount going on here in terms of the psychology of the mother, the psychology of the child, and this extraordinary setting up of this sort of tug of war over the child, but the child messes it because he's like the person in a sort of, you know, in a tug of war who sort of releases the rope first and lets everything collapse. The child is undermining it because he really, really wants to go. This is really, to my mind, the most intricate and inventive part of the whole tale, woven through with scriptural languages and references. The language and references. Thomas next describes William eating the meal in the house he is brought to, which is a Jew's house, utterly without fear, when the Jews fall upon him, tie him up, inflict torments on his body, and finally hang him between the doorposts. Thomas describes the boy's torture in extraordinary detail. I read some of it on other occasions, so I won't repeat it here. There's rope above all, this extraordinary form of killing, cruel particularly to a tender child's body. Rope as thick as a little finger, knotted in five places and tied around the child's shaven head so as to press ever so effectively into these pressure points, one here, two here, one behind, and one right here. And to add to the boy's suffering, a teasel is placed in his mouth. That is, it could be, of course, the plant, the teasel, the thorny plant, but it could also be a sort of man-made device that imitates the working of, the, of this plant head and which is used in the finishing and combing of woolen cloth. This scene is most elaborate and graphic and the richest in fateful resonances. Thomas draws parallels between the murder of William and the sufferings of Christ. Both have been betrayed, tortured, killed by Jews full of hatred and contempt. The rope of five knots is reminiscent of the five wounds of Christ. The boy's head is pricked with thorns reminiscent of the crown of thorns, which is both torture and, of course, mockery. Perhaps the teasel's association with wool itself is, um, evokes the Lamb of God or Christ the Shepherd, for in homes and workshops all over Norwich, the wool of Norfolk sheep was made into yarn for weaving into cloth then finished with the help of a teasel. And then after the torture comes the hanging between the doorposts. Here is a novel concoction of elements of the crucifixion and its typology. It evokes the sacrifices of the temple which prefigured Christ's suffering on the cross. And it's quite interesting that although the word crucifixion or none of the sort of versions of that word doesn't at all exist in this particular scene. It's later, ge later generations when they, um, when they depicted this, there was a little revival of interest in, in, in this boy in the 15th century because he became a patron of the, uh, of the um, uh, guild of um, Skinners in, uh, in Norwich. Uh, and we have two panels. One of them is actually the cover of my book, so I thought I'd share that with you. So if you see here and the next one, which is from I in Suffolk, in both cases, as you see, the boy is actually carrying a cross and nails, so like there's no ambiguity there. But in this situation, he doesn't, he doesn't actually say it that way in the text itself, but clearly when people talk about it and hear about it, it is a crucifixion, hence the later iconography. 
The Jews all but disappear from our manuscript after this first third that is a sort of reconstruction, as it were, of the cold case as Thomas of Monmouth arrives in 1150, hears the rumours of 1144, is appalled that the Jews haven't been punished and that the trial has not turned into the subject of a cult and tries to put it right by writing this very eloquent and suggestive text. He did not totally succeed because there was a lot of resistance to him in the cathedral from his own other monks. But uh, there is just enough there. The rhythm of the stories, of, of stories told like this one, um, you know, built on the always fascination uh, with children. And although, and it was a an attempt by Thomas to sort of construct a sense of solidarity and community uh, uh, in the cathedral, around the cathedral, and, and further on. Um, I've been able to establish a quite sort of new connection it wasn't, you know, just from by the sort of paleographical and codicological treatment of the manuscript, that this manuscript actually traveled in Cistercian circles. And as some of you may remember, uh, you know, Cistercians were great communicators. It's, it's, a, it's an order of, it's a monastic, new monastic order of the very late years of the 11th century, which spreads dramatically in the 12th and 13th all over Europe, even to, you know, Poland and Moravia and everywhere and Scotland, and, uh, and it is also, because it's constructed as an order, it communicates stories extremely well. So when I discovered that this was moving in Cistercian circle, I said, yes, that's going to reach the continent quite quickly, and it did. But even in England, the story is told, this type of story is told in Barry St. Edmunds in the 80s, in Gloucester uh, in, in the 60s, but it never quite reaches a sort of realization in terms of the development of a cult and the punishment of the Jews, partly because there are interventions in order to protect them. Not until, of course, uh, 1255, oh, that's the manuscript just for you to see. Not, of course, 1255, the case in Lincoln which, although the Jews are, are, are expelled in 1290, is nonetheless remembered sufficiently for uh, Geoffrey Chaucer to invoke it as part of the prioress's tale and, uh, and to expect them. There are a number of also French renderings of the story. So uh, there are traditions of memory that although Lincoln is rather special because it actually results in the execution of Jews, it's extremely nasty. Um, but there are other ways in which the story is remembered uh, in, uh, in, in, these, in these false, in, in these accusations that don't go very far, but also in actually one or two cases where it's parodied as a form of, um, as, a, as an example of the sort of credulity of people. They'll, they'll believe anything, they'll even believe that. That's for another time. But what struck me very recently was reconsidering um, how it might work even in cases where it's not a full-flung uh, type of uh, accusation, where it's just something that resides in the culture as perhaps a possibility. And this is the case of the chronicler Matthew Paris, the very, very great monk chronicler of 13th century England in his Chronica Maiora of 1244. He tells us a really quite extraordinary story. Just to show you, he was a quite extraordinary a chronicler, and he also added decorations himself to some of his manuscripts. It is really extremely interesting. Now, what he tells us is that in 1244, on the 1st of August, an unburied corpse of a child was found in the cemetery of St. Benedict's Parish in London. And on its hands, legs and chest were inscriptions of cursive Hebrew letters. Many assembled but could not read them. They could tell it was Hebrew, but could not read them. So they sent for some Jewish converts who lived in the house founded by the king in London. Does anybody know what house that is? The Domus Conversorum. It then became the uh, public record office, actually, until it moved to Kew. This is a special place that is founded by King Henry III in order to give a place of haven and sort of bonding for Jewish converts, which was he was encouraging through preaching and other ways, and also with a little stipend, because the idea was that if Jews convert, they lose their family networks, their, perhaps their connections, work, etc. This is a place for them to live. So there was a sort of, um, it was like a charitable institution, Domus Conversorum. So they ran to the Domus Conversorum, because that's where you find converts, uh, and ordered them, knowing that they would be fearful for their life and limb and were respectful of the king whom they loved, to tell them what the writing meant without lying. When the converts read the writing, and still this is Matthew, they studied and examined the letters for long without success. 
Because of the swelling and distortions of the skin and flesh, the letters were stretched widthwise here and there, and many were out of order, erased or illegible. This is a corpse after all. Finally, they discovered written the name of the child's mother and father, but no surname, and that the child had been sold to the Jews, but by whom and for what they could not tell. This child is, a so is being presented as something of a star, of a, I think in English it's called a star. But in any case, this is a sort of charter, a totally normal English legal charter, which marks a sale or a business arrangement, which bound Jews and Christians. We call them stars when these are charters that have an endorsement in Hebrew by the Jewish partner to the exchange. And hundreds have survived in, from medieval England. But what is this? Jews buying a child and endorsing its body with letters like they did for their business charters? Let us pick up the theme from yesterday's lecture, the body and its promise. For one of the powerful, or very powerful devotional images of later medieval England was indeed that of the Charter of Christ. This is a powerful image, and I'm afraid I could not find a fitting image to bring here, of Christ's body imagined. That is, this is a text which is also illustrated, and it's a text that purports to be the charter that Christ struck with humanity, a deal by which people will believe and Christ will save. And it says of itself that it is a charter written on Christ's skin with the ink that it Christ's blood, and it is sealed with the wax that is the wax of his tears and his sweat. Christ's body imagined as a charter for salvation, devotion, polemic, and the habitual sadness of children's vulnerability and death provided fertile ground for such imaginings as we see in Matthew Paris. Matthew described the converts caught up in this battle over identities and loyalties. Quondam Judei. Thank you. <laughs>